this talk is it's it's basically you know I've given this talk many times and I'm and I've added a bunch of new content here and this there'll be some video and some other stuff that I'll be able to show you to um, that you know you might not necessarily get somewhere else but you can always see this talk on TED.com uh, and the the core of this idea was presented for last year as a uh, TEDx talk at TEDx Mile High um, here in Denver and, and the basic idea is pretty simple. Um, and that is the earth is changing rapidly due to the climate crisis, uh, just general earth system change, increasing urbanization. And we have a very limited time to record our earth as it exists now for future generations. And, and we have the technology to be able to do that. We can just use LIDAR at a really high resolution and we can scan the surface of the earth and everything on it to create a digital twin, a permanent record that we can curate in perpetuity and pass on to our grandchildren's grandchildren. That's the, the, the basic core idea of this talk. And that's, that is the, 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 the idea behind what we're calling the Earth Archive, which is, a, which is a, a designed to promote this kind of global scam, scanning and then create a digital seed bank to preserve those records in per perpetuity. And it follows a lot of other great national programs that are, are trying to achieve the, the same thing at smaller scales. 3DEP, of course, is, is, a, is the prime example of that. So I'm an archeologist, I've done field work all over the world. And in 2015, I went to the Mosquitia rainforest in Honduras to field check, to field verify some LIDAR scans that we had done in uh, earlier, a couple of years earlier, that showed archeological remains. And it turned out that this Mosquitia place was the most astounding place that I've, I've been so far in my life and, and frankly might be the most astounding place I've, I'll, I'll ever go in my life. So having done field work all over the world, I thought I, I knew what to expect. I thought I had a pretty good handle on what, what I'd encounter. But man, was I wrong. <laughs> I, was, I was so wrong. And there are a number of things that really su surprised me about that pristine jungle environment. The first thing was that it's freezing. It's 90 degrees, and if you're in the sunlight, it's definitely very hot, but you're soaking wet from the humidity and the canopy of trees is so thick that sunlight never reaches the surface. You can't get dry. You're always cold. Immediately, I knew that I didn't bring enough clothing. And when I went back there about eight months later, I was fully outfitted with a, a fleece and, and um, you know, fall Colorado gear, which I pretty much wore all the time. So that's, that's the first thing that might, that might be surprising to people. The second thing is it, it's so noisy. So that first night, I felt things moving underneath my hammock, unknown creatures that were um, brushing and poking against the thin nylon fabric. And it was so noisy I could barely sleep. The jungle is loud, it's shockingly loud. It's like being inside of an airplane. It's like being downtown in a bustling city. And as the night wore on, it became increasingly frustrated with my sleeplessness, knowing that I had a full day of stuff ahead and um, you know, I wasn't gonna be able to focus because I was so tired. When I finally got up at dawn and looked around, it was clear that my sense of unseen things was all too real or hoof prints, paw prints, linear snake tracks everywhere. And what's even more shocking is we saw the animals in daylight. We saw those same animals. And they were completely unafraid of us. They had no experience with people. They had no reason to be afraid. Animals were walking through camp. They were walking up to us, staring at us, and then kind of shambling away. Um, it was beautiful. It was a little scary at the same time. 
Um, and that first night, we could actually hear jaguars and probably other kinds of big cats who, who were curious came into the came into the uh, uh, came into our camp um, to sort of check things out and see if there's anything consumable. Uh, <laughs> The thing that really surprised me though was that I didn't see a single shred of plastic. So as I walked towards the undocumented city, that place that we went to field verify using LIDAR, there was no plastic. There was no evidence of modern people. And I began to realize, it took me a little while, because I was pretty focused on uh, you know, getting the archaeology done, getting the science done. But I realized that people hadn't been in this place in centuries. And it's the only place that I'd ever been where there, there wasn't any plastic at all. No garbage, no debris. And that's when I really began to realize what a, what a special place this was and what a special experience that, that I was actually having in this place. And so it's funny to think that that will be my five minutes of fame, that clip of me waving my arms around like a giant orange bird is the, one of the most famous things that uh, people ever see. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show another clip here in a second. Uh, sometimes I talk over these clips. I'm not going to do that this time. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to, I'll tell you one quick story. Um, I don't have a visual for it. I'm sorry. And then I'll, uh, uh, I'm going to show you one other uh, clip that uh, most people haven't seen before. Um, honestly, now I'll kind of move on. But, one of the other, one of the other, you know, none of the animals had any, any fear of us. And there are amazing populations there of spider monkeys and howler monkeys. Um, howler monkeys sound like, the howler monkeys were interacting with the, the helicopter when it landed. Um, and, it, and they sound like, it sounds like a, a, a herd of Sasquatch. <laughs> it's absolutely, it's pretty amazing. Um, but the spider monkeys had no, they had, and none of these primates had any experience with people. They had no fear of people. So uh, I, I had this, I have this very vivid memory. It's one of, it's one of my, my favorite things that's ever happened to me. Um, we were, you know, walking through surveying, looking at one of these sites, and there was a troop of spider monkeys. Uh, there was dominated by a, a big, big male, and then a harem of females, and the male was not happy that we were in his space at all. And um, he, uh, so he proceeded to let us know that. And I was in the lead of this group of people that was moving through this area. And so um, his way of, of making his uh, displeasure known was by throwing stuff at me. And so he was kind of up in the trees above us and he was getting closer and lower and lower to me um, as, as we didn't react to him or move away and he started throwing branches and leaves or whatever. And then finally, he's like, I'm going to up the ante. I'm going to DEFCON 5. So he did the most insulting spider monkey thing that he could think of, which was by peeling these giant, beautiful flowers off of the top of this tree. And he started 
throwing flowers at me. So these flower petals are sort of raining down on me. And I'm like, wow, this is really, this is a unique thing that's happening here. This is a unique experience that, that, that we're, you know, in the midst of. And, and, and that's when I really begin to realize that this is something different that's happening here. I'll show you one other clip. And I like this clip because it shows sort of surveying, it shows us using technology. And then for this documentary, they have a very unique way of illustrating the point, crop, point cloud, which I, which I also really like. So I'll just let this part in. And I guess I can say one other thing, and that is that every, every one of these scenes that you're looking at is on top of an ancient city. So there's house mounds, pyramids, roads, underneath all of this. And you would never be able to see it without lighter. I have no idea it was there. Chris had a very sophisticated GPS unit, which had downloaded the lighter maps. And it showed where he was on those ladder maps. It's actually not so sophisticated now. <laughs> top of the line and he'll survey it through. So it shows you in real time where That's you are. That's only a couple years ago. You can also trace and digitize your features on here. And you can collect points. You can plot artifacts. So let's go up. Let's go up on top of this one and work our way back down that way. So it shows you in real time where you are. It has the GPS receiver antenna. It has a built-in, very sophisticated barometer, corrective satellites. Really nice math engine. All that stuff together means that once we're out here and we get a signal, you can walk for I think over a kilometer. So right now I'm getting accuracy of 70 centimeters or so. All right, let me look over this edge here. So I think it's surprising to, to many people that there are still places that are left on earth that are so untouched by people. But the fact of the matter is it's true. There are still thousands of places where humans haven't stepped for centuries or, or maybe even uh, forever. And um, here I have in my notes, the thesis -y bit. <laughs> uh, you know, it's a great time to be an archaeologist. It's a great time to be a scientist because we have the tools and technology now to understand our planet like never before. And in, in many respects, we can do this remotely. We've never been able to do that before in, in the way that we can do that now. And yet we're running out of time. The earth, our cultural and ecological patrimony is threatened by earth system change, the climate crisis. I feel an urgency to my work that I didn't feel 20 years ago. I'm almost panicked because I'm wondering how we can document everything before it's too late. I was trained as a traditional archeologist using basic methodologies that have been around since the 1950s, some of them actually since World War I, prior to World War II, turn of the last century. And that all changed for me in 2009 in Michoacan, Mexico. I was studying the ancient Parapacha Empire, which is a lesser known but equally impressive counterpart of the Aztec. Two weeks earlier, my team had discovered an ancient settlement. So we were painstakingly documenting building foundations by hand, uh, hundreds of them. And the basic archeological protocol when you're in that sort of situation is to find the edge of the settlement so you know what you're up against. And finally, after a week or so, my graduate students convinced me to do that. Find the edge, basically. They were like, find the edge, Chris. I'm like, okay, I'll go find the edge. Why don't you go find the edge? No, all right, I'll go find the edge. So grabbed a couple of cliff bars, some water, a walkie talkie, and I set out alone on foot, and I was expecting to encounter the edge, doing air quotes here, 
in just a few minutes, but minutes passed and then an hour. Uh, finally, I reached the opposite side of the Mall Pais, which is about a, oh, maybe two kilometers away or so. I was walking very slowly. <laughs> so I said, oh, I said out loud, there are ancient foundations all the way across. It's a city. Oh, shit. It's a city. And I said, oh, shit, because as soon as you invoke that term city in archaeology, it just ups the ante. Everybody's paying attention. The city wasn't supposed to be there, theoretically, based on the current models that we had for the development of this empire. It's not mentioned in historic documents. People are going to question what we found. They're not going to believe that we could see what we were able to see. They're not going to believe that this city had been there for decades and decades of centuries, really, without anybody knowing about it. It turns out that that seemingly small settlement that we discovered was actually an ancient urban megalopolis. And we now know that it covers about 26 square kilometers. So it's a lost city with as many building foundations as modern day Manhattan. An archeological site so big that it would take me decades, the entire rest of my career to survey fully, which was exactly how I didn't want to spend the entire rest of my career, exhausted, sweating, placating stressed out graduate students, tossing scraps of PB&J sandwiches to feral dogs, which, and, and this is also kind of an interesting, crazy thing. You know, here in the States, if my dog gets a whiff of peanut butter, he goes absolutely bananas. But people in Mexico really don't eat that. They don't eat peanut butter. And so the dogs have no experience with peanut butter or any of the processed foods that we would eat, um, you know, we, that we eat today. So my students and I, we have American, we have PB&J sandwiches, which is something that most people there would never eat. They think it's gross. And the dogs have zero interest in it. They won't, they won't eat the sandwiches if you present them to them. Um, just the thought of doing all of that for years and years bored me to tears. Uh, so I returned home to Colorado, poked my head through a colleague's door, and I was like, dude, there's got to be a better way. And he'd asked if I'd heard of this new technology called LIDAR, which I hadn't, and I looked it up, and everybody here knows what LIDAR is, so I don't have to <laughs> go through the rigmarole of what, explaining what uh, LIDAR is. But um, one thing I want to point out is that with LIDAR, of course, you record the Earth's surface and everything on it at a very high resolution. And that makes those uh, records, the ultimate conservation records, that are useful for an incredible host of sciences, not just archeologists, which I'll talk about here in a minute. I had just enough money left in the budget for a scan, so we did that. We, that's the first of two scans that we've done there. We used Merrick from here in Colorado. Merrick went to Mexico, flew the LIDAR, and sent back the data. And over several months, I learned how to practice what we call digital deforestation, a term I stole from another MAPS member, Ron Chapel, filtering away trees, brush, other vegetation to reveal the, ultra, all the, the cultural landscape below. And when I looked at my first, when we first started to learn how to use these LIDAR records, when I looked at my first visualization, I began to cry. I teared up because in just 45 minutes of flying, the LiDAR scan collected the same amount of data as what would have taken decades by hand. Every house foundation, road, building, terrace, pyramid, incredibly high resolution, representing thousands of people were born, loved, lived, and died in these spaces. And what's more, the quality of these data, were it wasn't compar comparable to traditional archeological research. It was much, much better. I knew this technology would change the entire field of archaeology and beyond in the coming years, and it, and it has. We returned to Honduras with a crack team of archaeologists and other scientists 
supported by National Geographic and a whole bunch of other people. And in a month, we excavated over 400 objects in what we now call the city of the Jaguar. We felt a moral and ethical responsibility to protect the site as best we could. But in the short time that we were there, the site inevitably changed. Gone was the, the tiny gravel bar where we first landed the helicopter. The grass was chopped down and the trees were removed to create a large landing zone. And without it, after just one season, the ancient canals we'd seen in our LIDAR scan were damaged or destroyed. And the Eden that I had first seen soon had large clearings in the central camp with lights in an outdoor chapel. Despite our best efforts to preserve the landscape as it was, things changed. In our initial LIDAR scan of this area, is now the only record of the city of the Jaguar as it existed just a few years ago. And this footage is from that time that we returned to conduct those excavations. conundrum. It's a problem for archaeologists. It's a problem for all scientists. It's impossible to study an area without changing it in some way. And regardless, the earth is changing. Ancient, ancient sites are being destroyed. Ecology is being lost. History is being lost. Just recently, we watched in horror as the Notre Dame Cathedral went up in flames. The iconic spire collapsed and the roof was all but destroyed. Miraculously though, art historians Andrew Talon and computer scientist Paul Blair scanned the cathedral using terrestrial LIDAR in 2010. At the time, their goal was to understand how the building was constructed. 
Now their LIDAR scan is the most comprehensive record of the cathedral, and it'll prove invaluable to whatever form the reconstruction takes. They didn't anticipate, they never could have anticipated the fire or how their scan would be used, but, but we're lucky to have it. We take for granted that our cultural heritage will be around forever. It won't. There are organizations like SciArc that are doing incredible work to scan historical monuments, but nothing similar exists for the Earth's landscapes. We've already lost 50% of the world's rainforests. We're losing 18 million acres of forest each year. And rising sea levels will make whole cities, countries, and continents unrecognizable. Unless we have a record of these places, no one in the future will even know they existed. Notre Dame is a tragedy, but to my way of thinking, we are losing hundreds of natural cathedrals, three football fields every minute by some calculations, in the Amazon alone. And the real tragedy, from my way of thinking, is that we will never know what we have lost because we don't have a record of these places. We don't even know what's there. And here's my great grand quote from the talk. <laughs> uh, and people have already stolen this, this quote. Uh, if the, and that's fine. If the Earth is the Titanic, we've hit the iceberg, everyone's on deck, and the orchestra is playing. The climate crisis, Earth system change, threatens to destroy our cultural patrimony, our e ecological patrimony within a few decades. It's sitting on our hands and doing nothing is not an option. Shouldn't we save everything we can on the lifeboats? Looking at my LIDAR scans from Mexico and Honduras, it's clear that we need to scan, scan, scan as much as possible as quickly as possible before it's too late. And that's what has inspired the Earth Archive, our an unprecedented scientific effort to LIDAR scan the entire surface of the planet, starting with areas that are most threatened. And that's exactly what we're calling for, a massive international effort to LIDAR scan the entire land mass of the planet, 29.2% of it, to create a digital twin a digital comprehensive baseline database, database of the Earth's surface and everything on it at a high resolution, something from which you can make products that are equivalent to at least 25 centimeter pixels. It is open sourced and accessible to as many as possible. We are aware and applaud previous calls to use new remote sensing technologies such as LiDAR to record broad areas of the earth. And there are several national initiatives such as 3DEP in the United States. These efforts are limited in geographic distribution and the resolutions that are called for in these applications are inadequate for those needed for cultural heritage man management and many ecological studies. So we're calling for a higher resolution record. And the purpose of the Earth Archive is threefold. Number one, create a baseline record of the Earth as it exists today to more effectively mitigate the climate crisis. The only way to measure change is to compare two sets of data, a before and an after. Right now, we don't have a high resolution before data set for most of the planet. We have better maps of the moon than we do of our own planet, frankly. So we don't know how things are changing and whether our efforts to combat the climate change, climate crisis are making a positive impact. Number two, build a virtual planet, a digital twin, accessible to any number of scientists so we can better understand our world today. Archeologists like me can discover undocumented settlements, Ecologists can study forest composition, tree size, age, and distribution. Geologists can study hydrology, faults, disturbances, and so on. I mean, the, it's 
it's, en it's endless what these records could be used for. Number three, preserve a record of the earth for our grandchildren's grandchildren so they can study and recreate our lost cultural and ecological heritage in the future. As science and technology advance, they'll apply tools, algorithms, and AI to LIDAR scans done today and ask questions that we can't currently conceive of. Like Notre Dame, we can't imagine how these records will be used, but we know that they'll be critically important. The Earth Archive is the ultimate gift for future generations. Because the truth is, I, I won't live long enough to see its full impact. And neither will you, but that's exactly why it's worth doing. The Earth Archive is a bet on the future of humankind, a bet that together, collectively, as people and as scientists, we will face the climate crisis and then we'll choose to do the right thing, not just for us today, but to honor those who came before us and to pay it forward to future generations who will carry on our legacy. And I think we've seen, we, we've, been, we've been given us a small window, a small gift of future vision that has come out of the, the climate crisis. You know, it's really, it's fascinating to me because I'm old enough. I mean, I'm very, I'm, I'm old, but I'm, I am, you know, you know, I teach these, these students that don't have a memory of what the United States looked like in the 1970s. And I remember going to big cities in the U.S. when I was a small kid in the early 70s, and I remember how smoggy and horrible they were. I remember what they actually looked like, as many of you probably do as well. But they, but they don't understand how effective, for example, the Clean Air Act has been. And so here, here we have three views, 1970. So I have to explain this to them. I have to show them. It's fascinating to me. I have to show them pictures of, um, you know, New York City and L.A. and Detroit and all these places so smogged in that they look like Beijing or something uh, today. And then we look at a view of what those places look like today. And then during the climate crisis, they were so clear. You could see the mount, you know, you see the mountains behind LA as shown in this slide on the right. And so we've been given, you know, from my way of thinking, we've been given this window of what the what the earth could look like in the future. And it's also given us the opportunity to think about what kind of world we, we want to see over the next century. The Earth Archive can help us build and plan that future world. And from my way of thinking, and I hope you'll agree, it's fundamental. It's fundamental to, to understand what kind of world that we could have in the future in terms of planning and development and preservation. And so what is the status of the Earth Archive today? Well, there are many technical grand challenges for the Earth Archive. Probably the social challenges are the hardest to solve. Permissions, access, capacity building, and analytics. This will be the true test of the Earth Archive, not, not the actual logistics and the mechanism behind the scans and all of that sort of stuff. Our first camp campaign is centered on scanning the Amazon. And we've begun to plan this work for early in 2021. Uh, we've started developing um, commissions and coalitions of scientists and policymakers and other concerned individuals in the nine countries that touch the Amazon, encompass the Amazon or touch the Amazon. And we're set, setting up areas of interest in these places to begin a phase one scan in many of these countries. And we're developing a crowdfunding platform to be able to do that, an innovative crowdfunding platform um, so please look for that, and we'd love to have your support for that, obviously. We believe, so put your seatbelts on, <laughs> but I truly believe that we can scan the Amazon in five years for $15 million. And, and I believe we can do that with the, with the appropriate corporate buy-in. Um, we're also going to hold a hybrid Earth Archive Congress in the spring of 2021. And we're looking for corporate sponsors and corporate buy-in for that event. 
And of course, the Earth Archive is actively seeking technology alliance partners that are interested in marketing and PR opportunities and, and tech opportunities to help us to, to help work with the, the Earth Archive. And of course, you can contact me or visit our website for more information. The website is theeartharchive.com. You can always email me or even call me or, link, or contact me on LinkedIn, whatever you want to do. I'm always available uh, to talk with people, to give talks like this if you want, um, you know, whatever, whatever it takes to help build and uh, promote the Earth Archive. And thank you very much. And I think there's time for, uh, I hope, I think there's time for questions. If people have questions, they can put a question, uh, they can put a question in the, the Q&A box um, or contact me. <laughs> There's actually one question in the chat box. Oh, is there? I can't see it. It's not in the... Uh, open questions, I see it. Could you just tell me what it is, Anne? Because I can't see it for some reason. Oh, what was the most unusual artifact you covered? So, so okay. Um, <laughs> there is a... Uh, so the artifacts at the at the city of the Jaguar were was a it was a cache of over 400 objects that were left there, and the artifacts were um, many manufactured from ground stone, uh, so they were polished and, and carved stones um, that were probably then painted and decorated. Most of them were seats; they're called matates, uh, like mono and matates, but that's not actually what they are. Um, but they're seats, they're actual ritual seats. And the one way that you show your eliteness in Mesoamerica and in the Americas in, in general is by not sitting on the ground. Common people sit on the ground. Elites, um, uh, elites sit uh, up, on, up on these seats. These artifacts were probably left there when the city was ritually closed. Uh, we believe it was from the impacts of European disease. Uh, at the time of European conquest. And so the seats were around, arranged in sign of sort of a, a final council and then ritually left there in the same way that you might close a church. At the center of that cache was a small bird effigy made out of stone. Uh, very important ritual item, probably represent, might have represented, for example, um, one of the, the sort of most important or main um, clans or groups within that city. And it was left at the center of the cache. It was completely encircled by roots. And it, we actually worked very, very carefully for several days to release that, that object from those roots so we could recover it. And it was as if the city didn't want to let the object go. And finally, at the very end, the one of our last days, one, one of our last days there to, uh, to actually remove the, the objects, finally the root system just literally let the object go. It was, it was very, um, it, it was very, frankly, it was very touching. So for me, um, that was the most, that, that was the most important, most amazing object that we recovered from the, from the actual city of the um, Jaguar. Okay, so what resolution do we envision using LiDAR? We, we want to create products that are on the order of 25 centimeters on a, uh, uh, by, uh, on a pixel. Um, so very, very high resolution uh, records. Um, let's see. Fascinating presentation. Is there already a video recording the City of the Jaguar study online? Um, there is a documentary. It hasn't really been released widely to the public. I showed a, a bit of it. Um, in the in the talk, there is a National Geographic Explorer episode that actually talks about the city. It's from 2015, October 2015, I think, and that is available on Amazon. If you go to the, the National Geographic Explorer channel um, on Amazon, you can buy it. It's like 99 cents. It's honestly not that expensive. Um, 
what are easy ways for all of us to help slow down the deforestation of the Amazon? Well, when we do the crowdfunding, <laughs> you, can, uh, you can contribute to the Earth Archive and help uh, sponsor that, those scans that we'll do of the Amazon. Um, but I think the most important thing that we can do is to help our friends and neighbors in South America politically that are uh, battling with current administrations there to help halt uh, deforestation. And there are several organizations, uh, conservation organizations that are, uh, that are helping with that um, sort of uh, battle. Um, small question about your, just wondering how do you make decision to go to the place you think you'll find something valuable? That's a great, that's a great question actually. And um, for a modern archeologist, excavation is kind of the final thing that we would do. And many people don't do excavation because it is, uh, you know, archeology span is the only science that destroys its evidence um, when it undertakes its study. You know, we can't, um, we can't go back and replicate an experiment like other sciences can, you know, so we can't go and add, you know, five liters of orange liquid to the blue liquid and then get a whatever liquid kind of thing. Can't replicate our studies. So we're typically very, very careful about excavating. And it's kind of only done as a last resort, really. And, and, and that's the interesting thing about LIDAR and some of the, a lot of these digital recording techniques is that for the first time, uh, archaeology and ecology and many of the observational sciences um, will actually be able to go back and replicate uh, their work. So it's actually interesting in that way. But the places that we study are, there's a long string of decisions that we make and it all has to do with the questions that we have about why people organize themselves in certain ways in the past and what influenced their decisions. So for example, I, I, one of the things that I've always done is study ancient landscapes, land use, uh, ancient human impacts on the landscape, and I've looked at uh, urban areas and how those areas are impacted and change the landscapes around them. So the decisions about where I excavate, there's a long string of theoretical things that I go through that help me determine which sites to sort of uh, uh, look at. Um, who makes up the international effort of the Earth Archive? Well, that's us here in the, we're based in Colorado, but we have uh, the broader Earth Archive community now is, strength, is made up of scientists, poly, policymakers, stakeholders in the member countries where we're gonna actually do these scans. So right now we're focused on our first campaign will be the Amazon. So we're building coalitions of people in the nine countries that encompass the, um, uh, in, encompass the Amazon area. But we're also getting a, a lot of inquiries globally and we're starting to build coalitions of scholars in many different parts of the world to promote scans and, and collect these kinds of data. Uh, are you thinking of utilizing um, other technologies as they come online, such as SAR? Absolutely. And we'll, we'll beg, borrow, and steal, what, steal whatever technologies we can to create these high-resolution three-dimensional records. Right now, uh, the, the, the best technology we can use is airborne, airborne LiDAR. But we'll, we'll take whatever we can get, frankly. Uh, what do we consider to be the most endangered part of the earth? This is actually, it's another great question. <laughs> and you know, what, what I consider endangered or what I feel is the most endangered place is not something that, you know, other scientists might do. You could, we could probably get 20 scientists in the room and, and, you know, ask them for their top five endangered places and we'd get a different, hopefully we get similar places, but probably we wouldn't get slightly different places. So one of the things we want to do and, and I think there's obvious places in that. I think the Amazon, to my way of thinking, is, is possibly the most endangered place right now, uh, especially given what's happening in Brazil. Uh, but the, the tropical forests of Central Africa, et cetera, there are many other potential hotspots in the world. So one of the things we're gonna do with this hybrid Congress that we're having in the spring is one of the big discussion points, topics, 
is going to be where are these endangered places? How are we defining what's an endangered place? Uh, you know, where should where else should we be looking? And I think that'll be a I look forward to that conversation, actually. I think it'll be really fascinating and, and, and fun. Uh, what has been accomplished to secure the funding technology and logistics to achieve the globe, to achieve the globe since you envisioned this effort? Uh, we've made great progress this year and we do have some funding. Um, we've really uh, focused on um, organizing the, the sort of basic organization of the Earth Archive. We started a nonprofit. Uh, we've partnered with several great companies. One of those is Voxel Maps. So we're going to use a voxel format uh, from Voxel Maps to present the data and hopefully analyze it. And that, to me, that's really exciting um, because, uh, you know, that voxel maps, it's a 3D format. It's really a 4D format because it includes time. Time is one of the parameters that you can insert into those voxels. To me, I, and I'm really excited about that because to me that is a true 21st century technology. That's the way that the, that 4D technology is the way that we're going to analyze these records. And the thing that's always really bummed me out about the way that people use LIDAR today is that they mostly just skim off all of the three-dimensional data flatten everything into a 2D plus kind of record, and then use really traditional kinds of imaging analysis to, uh, to, to, to look at the, um, to analyze the, the, the LIDAR records. In that voxel format from voxel maps, what I'm hoping, when I expect it will happen, and I know it will happen actually, is that we'll be able to begin to analyze these point cloud data. We'll be able to analyze the point cloud data in a, through, a true three-dimensional or four-dimensional format. And to me, I think that's like a really exciting uh, avenue of research. And, it, and, and if we're able to promote that with the Earth Archive, I think that's awesome. Uh, we have, Mike Tully, what resolution points per square meter lighter did you acquire over the site? Do you know what the horizontal positional accuracy was of this data? I do. I don't know that offhand. I mean, I have all those specs, and if you give me a call, we can. I can share some of that information with you. Um, I know, you know, the 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 Honduras data was done in 2012. Was scanned in 2012, and the instrument that was used then was not as accurate as an instrument that you would have today. And that's a 50 meter canopy. So that's arguably as dense as vegetation gets globally on this planet. So from those data, we were able to make a product that had uh, basically a one meter pixel size. From Mexico, we have two scans. The last one was done with a more modern instrument in 2015. And from those data, we typically use a product that's 25 centimeters uh, on a side per pixel on a side. So it's a little higher resolution, but it's also it's, a, it's, it's not a 50 meter canopy, it's a 20 meter canopy. So it's a little different. Uh, the vegetation obviously isn't as dense, but I do have those tech, the tech data. And I should say, I'm not a tech person. I'm, an, I'm just an archeologist, <laughs> you know? So um, we have people, you, there are other people you can talk to that know, know more about that specifically, but why aren't those guys in the video all, well, I was definitely sweaty. Thanks, Anne, for that question. Um, I definitely was sweaty. Uh, I don't know about the other guys. Uh, I know I lost a lot of weight. It's a great way to lose weight, actually. I lost like maybe 10 pounds in a week there or something. It was awesome. Uh, Chris, thank you for your insight. Can you please share any of the lighter technical collection plans for the Amazon? We're developing those plans right now. Um, and if you want to get involved with that, uh, Brian, please, please contact us. Um, the logistics are going to be a bear. And, and we're trying to, we're working on that right now as you speak, as, as we speak. Um, to my, and you know, again, I'll, I want to reiterate, you know, there, there are a lot of grand challenges associated with creating the Earth Archive, I think as everyone can imagine or knows. Some of those are centered on tech things, scanning, how we're actually going to do the scans, logistics wise and stuff. Those are all solvable as far as I'm concerned. The real issues, again, are, are the social issues, getting the permissions, navigating the political 
um, the political uh, climate of these various countries, trying to remain sort of politically neutral if we can. Those are, and then capacity building, uh, dealing with stakeholders, indigenous people, all that. So those are the real big challenges I see for, um, for, the, uh, for the Earth Archive. Earth Archive. Um, are you using the integration of LiDAR imagery and photo point clouds and other sensors in your work? Uh, from Mark uh, Saigon, I guess, Saigon. Uh, yeah, so we hope to do that. We're mostly focused on the ALS, the airborne, the airborne LiDAR data, but um, we, would, we would like to include, and we will be able to include other kinds of uh, uh, other data sources as, as available. Um, how do you handle the safety regarding the local social and political environment from Connie? Um, you know, that's also a huge issue and it's something that we really faced in, in Honduras. I especially faced that in 2016 when we went back uh, to do the excavation. Um, you know, this work is important, the archeology span is important, but it's not worth dying over. And so safety is a, a, a absolutely a, a huge concern. And we had several incidents that happened um, in Honduras that still sort of haunt me today. One of those uh, involved the, the helicopters that we were using. We were using Honduran helicopters. They were, um, uh, the main helicopter that we were using was a Huey. It was built in 1969, saw service in Vietnam, was refurbished in Taiwan, and then ended up back in Honduras. I think it actually was used during the Iran Contra stuff as well, but um, the Contra, Contra stuff. But uh, the, the maintenance on those helicopters wasn't that great. And on one of the last flights out of the jungle with a bunch of my people in the helicopter, uh, the door popped off the side of the helicopter, went down the side of the boom, almost went up into the rotor, almost went into the tail rotor. And then somehow, <laughs> I, I don't know how this happened. I mean, I wasn't on the helicopter. It actually slid off the bottom of the helicopter and then fell into the jungle and didn't hit anything critical and they were able to get the helicopter back. But I'm still haunted by that, by that today uh, because I know that um, if those people had uh, been harmed and it was my responsibility, I, I, I would have a hard time sort of living with that. So safety, and then, of course, also in Honduras, we all got a, a lot of us got a flesh-eating parasite that's not uh, necessarily curable. And it, it, it does, it has caused some physical harm to people um, uh, still to this day. So given all of those experiences, safety is of, of, of paramount concern. And it's something that we take very, very seriously. And I definitely would not put people into harm's way. And we will have safety consultants and um, local folks or whatever. And we're just going to be as careful as we, we possibly can and make safety a, a serious concern. But it is, it is an issue that we've had many, many discussions about. And we will continue to have discussions about it. Uh, is there any participation from local states and organizations? So it's entirely a U.S. venture. So we're, yeah, so it's an international, it's U.S. based. It's an international venture. We're partnering with academic institutions and other people in many other countries. And we're um, being considered to, uh, for inclusion in a UNESCO program for the preservation of digital heritage. So we will be, uh, hopefully shortly, <laughs> we're still working it out, but hopefully shortly we'll be a UNESCO affiliated program. So it'll be, it's an international, truly is an international, international effort. And we believe that we also will have regional storage uh, depots for data. So we'll store but the data here in the States, we'll store it in the member countries where the scans are happening. And then we also might have digital seed banks, maybe one in Europe, maybe one in Japan, something, something like that to, to make it an international um, effort. Uh, integration of LiDAR imagery and photo point clouds and other sensors. Yeah, so we're, we're trying to do that. Um, 
so we've talked about resolutions of the LIDAR shuttle radar topography mission. It's seminal, I mean, it's seminal work. Uh, it's inspirational. Um, we'd love to have a spaceborne instrument. Word on the street is that we're a couple decades away from having a, um, a LIDAR instrument. I know about JEDI, but, but JEDI is not it's not exactly at the kinds of resolutions uh, that we would love. We'd love to have a spaceborne instrument. I don't know. Maybe if Elon Musk is listening. He can um, <laughs> he can build us one. And if Elon Musk is listening, by the way, dude, let's go to Mars. It's awesome. I don't want to go. But somebody should go. But we have a lot of work to do on our own planet, <laughs> and we can do it for a lot cheaper than we can send, you know sending it somebody to Mars. Uh, um. I guess that's it. I don't know if anybody has any other uh, questions. Well, if you want to contact me, send me an email, give me a call, contact me on LinkedIn, go to the website, theeartharchive.com. Uh, you can contact me anytime, very accessible. <laughs> Um, you can contact anybody from the Earth Archive. We'd love to talk to you. I'll give talks or presentations to anybody that so desires. Uh, if you want to hear me talk, if people want to hear me talk, I'll definitely do that. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I think, Mark, are we, am I, am I good to go? I think you are, Chris. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I would think that our membership would really like to have you back at some point. A lot of times at, at our events, um, our spouses and our children are there. I think they would have found this fascinating as well. So thank you very much, Chris. We appreciate yeah, thank it. Thank you. I'll give a talk to anybody anytime. Just let me know. Thanks a lot, everybody.